Welcome back folks. Uh, last thing to talk about here in this chapter is some energetics of transport and this follow on a little bit from the discussion we had earlier about dynamics of the GLUT1 transporter. So um, let's kind of just start out generally speaking about this. If I were thinking about solutes moving down gradients and up gradients via active transport and down gradients and facilitated diffusion that kind of thing Every time you think about a transport event in the cell, um, try to think about it as an energy transaction. So whether energy is required for that event to occur or whether um, energy is liberated um, or, or made available to do work when that um, transport event takes place. So if we're thinking about uncharged solutes, and we'll start with simple to start with and we'll start with uncharged solutes. Um, the only variable for an uncharged solute um, in terms of the kinetics and energetics of it moving is the concentration gradient. Now when we get to charged solutes, um, the energetics are going to be influenced by both the concentration gradient and the charge on the solute, and we'll talk mainly about ions in that case. Um, an important thing to think about is that if we have an event which is energetically favorable, that doesn't mean the opposite won't happen. The opposite can happen, it's just we have to put some work in to allow that transport event to occur. So we're going to look at some scenarios where we have um, uh, a solute moving from a concentration outside the cell to a concentration inside the cell. Now let's just start off a um, uh, kind of simplest scenario we can. Let's just have um, a lipophilic solute, small, that can freely diffuse back and forth across the membrane and we let it come to equilibrium. And so at that point, the concentration outside the cell is the same as the concentration inside the cell. So if we were to calculate the equilibrium constant for that, it would always equal one because at equilibrium, the concentration inside the cell of the solute is going to be the same as the concentration outside of the cell. It doesn't matter what those numbers are, any number over itself always divides out to be one. So a solute that's come to equilibrium, here we see that equilibrium constant always equals one. And so no work can be done here and no work is needed to get to this point. So I'm not sure how much use that is to us, except to think about delta G. So let's kind of then think about delta G and let's go back to some of those uh, equations that we used to look at enzyme kinetics and um, and revisit those again in the context of solute transport. Here's the equation we just looked at, and remember that just says that if we've got a solute that's moving freely back and forth across the membrane at equilibrium, the equilibrium constant will be one because any number over itself will be one and the solutes come to equilibrium, so it's the same concentration out as in. Now let's kind of, uh, rather than thinking about concentrations of, sol of substrates for, for reactions to occur, we can just substitute in the solute concentrations inside and outside the cell. And this is for a solute moving outside to in. If you wanted to think about this in the other direction, you would just reverse these two. So you just got to bear in mind, outside to in, you put in over out. And if you want to go from in to out, you put out over in. So you have to learn that, you have to memorize that. So let's go back to this equation. Now, we looked at this before to look at basically um, uh, this influence on delta G. And delta G, the change in free energy as the solute moves across a membrane, is uh, this function here, uh, which we looked at before in the context of enzyme kinetics, um, plus uh, the standard free energy change, uh, under, so that's the free energy change under standard conditions. And so that value there, delta G naught, is the same as minus Avogadro's gas constant times the temperature in Kelvin multiplied by the natural log of the equilibrium constant. This we also saw before. If you go back and look at that video, you'll see that this was the same when we looked at enzyme kinetics. Now, Fortunately here, if we put the equilibrium constant in here uh, as being one, then we end up with minus RT natural log of one, which is zero. So in that case, this value becomes zero and we can cancel it out. And so therefore the delta G for the inward movement of a solute is simply uh, the function of the Avogadro's gas constant multiplied by the temperature in Kelvin times the natural log of the solute concentration inside 
over the solute concentration outside and then that delta G will tell you whether this process is endergonic or exergonic and really this is just simply the mathematical expression of if solutes can move they will move down the gradient with the release of energy and we will see that here by having a negative delta G. Now if we saw a positive delta G, a positive value here, then that tells us that we have to put energy in. But as what this would show us is if we set up a concentration gradient across a membrane, this value delta G would be negative if we're talking about the solute coming down its gradient from outside the cell to inside the cell, or we rearrange the equation to go from inside the cell to outside and we put a high concentration in and a low concentration outside. So this is just really a mathematical expression of something you, that you, you, you know intuitively already. Let's look at an example to concrete this and make it a little bit more um, cemented in the mind. Let's suppose that uh, we've got a bacterium and bacterium often like to grow on the sugar lactose, so that should be your fun in milk. Um, so let's say that the concentration inside the bacterium of lactose must be kept at 10 millimolar so it's 10 to the minus 3 molar and the external salt solute the external lactose concentration is 0.2 millimolar so that's 0.2 times 10 to the negative 3 molar so uh, we've got a uh, high concentration inside the cell not so much outside the cell but we've got to keep this concentration at 10 millimolar inside so we can determine mathematically the energy requirement for the inward movement of lactose now let's think about it because what I often see people doing when they have these problems is they plug and chug numbers and they don't think about what this actually means and so they come up with a number and they turn that in and they put it in a quiz and they're like that's good and it's the complete opposite because they've had a brain fart or something so let's think about this we've got a low concentration outside the cell a high concentration inside the cell we've got inside over outside in our equation so we're looking at the outward to the inward movement if the concentration is high inside and low outside, we must be doing some work. So the value that we return must be a positive number. Delta G here for the inward movement of lactose under these conditions must be a positive value. So let's put the numbers in and see if what we do makes sense. So let's put in the lactose concentration inside. There it is, 0.01 molar. And the lactose concentration outside, 0 0.0002 molar. And we plug in the Avogadro's cast constant, 273 plus 25 Celsius. Um, to give us 298 Kelvin. We take the natural log of 0.01 over 0.002 and that all mm, kind of rolls down to being 2.32 kilocalories per mole. So that value is positive. This makes total sense. We've got a lot, of, a lot of lactose inside the cell, not so much outside the cell. We need to do some work if we're going to bring that in. Um, now, um, Obviously, let's just back up on. Obviously, if we reverse that situation and we were talking about the outward movement of lactose and we let lactose move out of the cell, delta G there is going to be negative. Uh, and it's just going to be that we change the sign. We, we change this from positive 2.32 to negative 2.32. Uh, all that's changed here is the sign when we change the numbers out inside and outside so they're flipped. Okay, so let's now think about a charged solute moving outside to inside. Now, like we talked about before, when we think about solute movement, we've got to think about the concentration gradient, and if it's a charged solute, the electrical gradient. So there'll be two components to calculating delta G in the case of a charged solute. So now, is what we have is we have the inward flux will be the change in free energy with the inward flux of a solute that's charged here will be the same as it was before. So this is the contribution of the concentration gradient, just like we just worked out. So that's the contribution of the contribution gradient to the free energy change. But now we've got this value here, um, Z, F, V, superscripted M. So um, is what we're talking about here is a solute with a charge and, and so Z is the charge on the solute. Okay, so chloride ion, negative one. Proton, positive one. And so that there is the charge of the ion. F is the Faraday constant. Okay, Vm is the membrane voltage potential. So that's the membrane potential. So that's going to be expressed in volts. And so you'd need to know that. Um, you may be able to work it out given given uh, different solute concentrations across the membrane, but it's easiest. A lot of times you often be told what that is. So uh, for a typical cell, that value is going to be negative because the inside of the cell is maintained at a slightly negative 
uh, potential because of charges on proteins, charges on solutes, primarily ions, compared to the outside of the cell. So the inside of the cell is relatively negative, so this value is often a negative value in the millivolts range. So um, once you understand what these all are, then you can substitute in some numbers. Uh, we'll do an example in a moment. Now, if we wanted to think about the outward movement of a charged solute, then the change in free energy with the outward movement is just the inverse of the change in free energy with the inward. And that's because of what I just explained just now, is that, is that, is that if everything's reversed, then all we've got to do is change the sign of delta G, and, uh, and we're good to go. So let's look at an example of this. Um, here's our equation at the top here. Change in free energy with the inward movement of a charged solute is Avogadro's constant multiplied by the temperature in Kelvin, you're sticking 298, multiplied by the natural log of the substrate concentration inside, over the substrate concentration outside, plus this variable here, which takes into account the electrical contribution to the free energy that's released when the solute moves. That is Z, the charge on the on the particle. And so if it's a uh, calcium ion, that would be two plus. Faraday constant times by the membrane potential expressed in volts. So we have 1.987 for the Avogadro's gas constant, 298 for temperature in Kelvin. And then um, let's say that we've got a, um, a nerve cell with a chlorine concentration, a chloride ion concentration inside of 50 millimolar. And outside we've got a chloride ion, ion concentration of 0.1 molar, that's 100 millimolar. So that's uh, for a nerve cell there. So let's put those values in there. And then when we uh, add in the contribution of the electrical um, component of the gradient. That's the electro part of the electrochemical gradient. Uh, the charge on a chloride ion is minus one. There's the Faraday constant. And we're using a membrane potential here of negative 60 millivolts, which is negative 0.06. So when we work all these numbers out, we come out to plus 0.97 kilocalories per mole. So the inward movement of a calcium ion here is, is, is very slightly um, endergonic. Now, if we're talking about the outward flux of this calcium ion, then it would just be the inverse of this value, negative 0.97 kilocalories per mole. So that's how we work out the, the free energy change associated with the movement of a solute across a membrane. So we'll wrap it up there. Uh, that's the end of this chapter, and I'll see you next time when we're getting ready for some new material.